the number of organized workers is too few and too uh, sporadically placed to really even depend, you know, defend the territory that they have staked out. So our guest for overtime this week is Chris Townsend. Chris Townsend is a former national staffer for the United Electrical Workers, um, also recently retired from his gig at the ATU as National Director of Organizing. Chris, thank you so much for talking to us. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So we wanted to talk to him because he is the there. There has really been a resurgence in interest around the writing of William Z. Foster. William Z. Foster was a union organizer in the 20th century, extremely successful, um, and he has particularly there's been there's been a particular resurgence in interest around him following the win at the Staten Island Amazon warehouse by the Amazon Labor Union, because Justine Medina mentioned that a cadre of the organizers there um, read a lot uh, a collective, uh, a collected writings of William Z. Foster. And so I wanted to talk to somebody who knew a little bit about William Z. Foster, and I asked around, and uh, and, and this guy's name kept coming up, Chris Townsend, um, partially because he was... Um, almost single-handedly responsible for getting uh, for getting Foster's writing back into print. Um, so you know, I think great guest to have. Before we dig in, before we dig into um, William Z. Foster, can you uh, you know, if, if you would introduce yourself and, and talk to us some about your journey in the late, like what got what kind of got you into the labor movement what m- made it so that you know you spent 29 years with UE you spent some time as a member of the ATU before that and then you spent 9 years as director of organizing for the ATU right so this is something that you've really devoted your life to why is that yeah thank you uh Jake and thank you uh Adam uh for having me yeah Chris Townsend uh I, I always say, you know, I, I think I am more reflective of union organizers than than you might think. But but you wouldn't have anything to measure that against because you may never have met another union organizer. We're invisible uh, and that has its good and its bad. But we are invisible for a variety of reasons. Now, William Z. Foster was not invisible. He was nationally, internationally known. So in any case, in my case, I grew up in Pennsylvania, Um uh, perfectly ordinary working class kid and uh, took on a left wing political bent when I was a teenager of shortwave radio and just reading and paying attention, watching the state of the country at that time and uh, and didn't go to college. There was no college uh, in my future. So I went to work and thank goodness when I went to work, I had had some understanding of the politics and some understanding of the labor movement. And it came in significant measure because of the book, uh, American trade unionism. I'll give it a plug here. You'll, you'll never miss it. It has this photo on the front, William Z. Foster's American trade unionism principles, organization, strategy, and tactics by uh, international publishers, international publishers. But in any case, I, as a young left winger, I went to a meeting, probably one of the first, actual left-wing meetings in the late 70s, 1979, actually, that I'd gone to. And this book was circulating there. And it was really a meeting primarily of students and college activists and campus uh, socialists and whatnot. But I, uh, being a young worker, someone who was right at that point going from high school to work, I didn't know where I was going at the time. But I saw that book and I thought, man, that looks interesting. Maybe I'll check this out. Well, It sounds a bit like a cliche, but my life was significantly changed for the better because of Foster's book, because it gave me an introduction to, you know, the history, the labor movement. It's good, bad and ugly that comes along with it. And of course, the employers and the state government forces and federal government forces that play a role on this. And then some overall glue of political ideology that got, you know, guided him. And I became just completely taken with that book. Foster wrote probably a dozen books in his career, Misleaders of Labor, 
uh, American trade unionism was a collection of his works, uh, pages from a worker's life, which is just little vignettes from his life. So I sought those out over a couple of years. And I, I just saw myself as in fundamental agreement with him. And, uh, you know, he, he went through somewhat of an evolution of his career, you know, as a worker and then as a trade union uh, functionary and a labor leader. And, and I guess I have too, but anyway, that, that's kind of in a nutshell. I spent, uh, you know, a number of years in ATU as a rank and file member shortly after that meeting that I referenced, I, I went to Florida. That meeting was in Pennsylvania, but I went to Florida and fell into a local organizing drive of the amalgamated transit union and certainly put the foster knowledge to work. The old guys that ran my local at that time were all somewhat devotees of foster, which was almost lucky uh, that that was the case. But then uh, I left when I met my wife, returned, came up North again, and I belonged to a couple of different unions. And then I joined UE, the United Electrical Workers or UE, a fairly well-known union for folks who spend some time looking at the labor movement. And I went on and become a staff member. And I was, among other things, I was an international representative. Then I was the political director for 20 years until I retired. And I only retired when I did in 2013 because I had a chance to return to ATU. But uh, to return at the time I did as an international organizing director. And it was a remarkable thing in a lot of ways. It was painful for me to leave UE. But sometimes, you know, the ring comes along and you grab it. And I don't regret it, but when I grabbed it, I went back to ATU, and it was remarkable for a lot of reasons, including it was like nothing had changed since I had been in ATU 35, 38 years before. Uh, the organizing department almost didn't exist. There was no campaign department. There was no education department. There was no collective bargaining department. There was no international rel- I mean, all these things that I sort of thought that a big, large, modern union might have didn't exist. So my job became setting up two departments, new organizing, uh, really restarting that, and then setting up the field mobilization, you know, to give the union some capacity to fight back and campaign when needed. Um, I did that. And uh, at the end of that eight years and some months, I retired here just recently. And uh, and now I'm devoting myself totally to uh, – you know, revisitation and republishing of Foster's works and any number of other, uh, you know, militant trade union uh, voices that were out there and have gone extinct almost because uh, maybe I'll wind up by saying that, you know, Foster can be found online. Of course, he he wrote a considerable amount over his career. He was well known, at least to academics and some uh, unionists like us, but, uh, I'm unaware of any book that he wrote or any collection of his works. And, that, and, and uh, you know, I'm a bit of a critic of folks trying to really do substantial reading online. I'm unconvinced that uh, folks can really do it. So I think the printed word, the physically printed word, is still just much more important for workers. Something you could take to work, read at lunch, take with you, go out and sit up under a tree and read, read on a rainy day and, and that capacity. So we've gotten Foster's American trade unionism back into print uh, just a couple of years ago. And it's turned out to be very timely. I didn't know that. I was hoping for that, but I didn't know that, but it's out there and uh, there will be more to follow. Well, that that's fantastic. And, and it sounds like, you know, William Z. Foster was a very, very influential figure um, in your life. And, and, and that's a you know that that's as good a place as any to jump into what American trade unionism contained. Uh, what you mentioned that it was a collected works. Um, what are what are the works specifically in American trade unionism, which is the book by William Z. Foster that has that has kind of taken off as you were able to a, a couple of years ago get it back into print um, and has taken off as, as something that um, particularly younger and militant unionists are reading. Yeah, sure. I'm, I, you know, I sat and I made a list. I'm a list maker. So I made a little list because I sort of know I've been dealing with Foster's works and I never met him. I mean, he died the year I was born. So I never, ever had a chance to meet him. Now I have met 
they're all gone too. Any number of longtime trade union and radical functionaries who knew Foster or worked with Foster. I guess I knew a little bit his last secretary, Arthur Zipser, who did a biography of Foster. That's another one of the books that we are going to get back out. So uh, I guess I was acquainted with some of his friends and colleagues, but not very many. But anyway, I kind of, you know, his whole thematic uh, push as a militant trade unionist, I think it just has become merged with my own thinking. So that's why I sat down. I thought I better I better make a little list. Uh, So I just went through the book and here in brief, here's kind of the, the highlights of what folks may already know about Foster, but should know about Foster if they don't, which was he was the advocate of a concept known as the militant minority, meaning that you're never going to get everybody. You you shouldn't sit at home and bemoan the fact that you can't get everybody to support what you're doing. A militant minority of people are going to move the larger mass and that that can be done and it should be done and it will be done. And it's proof of what we see going on at Starbucks and Amazon, many of the other organizing things, the concept of the militant minority. He had a concept that he used in terms of, commanding the militants and the activists to do what he called bore from within. What does that mean? Bore from within, go to the existing unions and try to uh, reform them and push them in an aggressive direction. Don't go out and try to start pure conjured out of thin air, new unions, perfect unions, idealized unions. No bore from within, Go to the existing union. That's where the members are. That's where the resources are. See if you can move them forward and do that. Uh, He had a concept that uh, nothing I've seen in 45 years has proven this wrong. The left wing must do the work. Let's get this on the record, uh, guys. Republicans don't organize unions. They would liquidate us. Uh, (laughs) You know, they have done a pretty good job for it. Democrats, mainstream Democrats, by and large, don't organize unions. These are people that have a whole different political orientation. When you get to the left of that, you will begin to find the people who will organize unions, tend to unions, keep them going, you know, use them. So the left wing are, is what must do the work. Foster also was an inveterate oppo- opponent of business union corruption. Any notion that the union would have any other purpose to exist other than to serve the members and serve them aggressively in terms of taking on the employers, taking on the politicians. So he was an inveterate foe of business unionism and all the corruption and problems associated with that. He was a, before it was a popular thing, he was an absolute, uh, almost zealous advocate of industrial unionism getting away from the old craft model where you had 26 different unions that were trying to organize one workplace. Everybody was going to be in the particular little slice that they were in. He, he saw that this was archaic and impossible, always doomed to failure when the employers turned against it. So he became a, a tremendous advocate of industrial unionism and he's credited correctly. So with having done because of the decades of the work that he did to promote the whole concept of industrial unionism. He's given appropriate credit for laying a lot of the foundation for what became the Congress of Industrial Organizations in the 1930s. It wouldn't have existed in the form that it did if it hadn't been for Foster's work with the great packing house organizing campaign uh, during World War I and then at what came after the great steel strike that he organized in 1919. So uh, he he promulgated a whole notion that these various craft unions should amalgamate, he called, meaning merge together, that they should unify and stop each one pursuing their own tiny little turf and that they should unify and take on the employers as a whole in an amalgamated form. And uh, I think that that's begun to happen in modern times. More and more of these unions will team up and join together. So that was Foster's whole concept of um, amalgamation. He was an advocate for mass campaigns of organizing, not piddling away one shop at a time. Nothing wrong with that. We're always gratified when any workers, you know, if a couple people someplace want to join the union, well, let's applaud it. But we need to move the masses of the people. The crisis that we face in the United States and that you guys have always faced in the South is that the number of organized workers is, you know, too few 
and too uh, sporadically placed to really even depend, you know, defend the territory that they have staked out. So mass campaigns of organization was Foster's mantra. Uh, he was a great advocate of reviving strike struggle, uh, not in a reckless way, not in a wild man way, but in a very skilled and planned, uh, thought through methodology. Strike struggle was clearly something that he was able to to uh, perfect that technique. Uh, he was an early advocate amongst many of the unions for an absolute unity of white and black workers. Now, that would be a much more diverse unity that we would have to call for today. But if you think about the United States, it was usually white and black was the dichotomy, even in my time. Uh, at that time, most of the immigrants were white, so it was still a white-black unity. But Foster Hood hit this head-on to say we had, as the white workforce, we had to unify somehow on a trade union basis with the masses of African-American or what they used to refer to as Negro workers, uh, the working class out there in industry after industry, or else we were going to go nowhere uh, without them. Uh, and then the last couple, Foster was a passionate advocate for political independence of the labor movement. Uh, folks don't know this anymore, but there used to be an entire section of labor leadership that was ad adhering to the Republican Party. If you can believe this, it seems I mean, the Republican Party today would throw you out if they knew you were a union leader. Uh, but there used to be uh, the Republican Labor Committee. And of course, today that's gone, wiped out. And now we've all been shoveled into the Democratic Party. But the Democratic Party uh, has a very, very uneven record of its support for working people and uh, organized labor. So the Democratic Party and the Republican Party being the two parties nationally that we're allowed to have, and we can back that up. This is a legal monopoly of these two parties, really, in a de facto way. Uh, Foster always argued for independence from that uh, to try to make the kind of progress that neither one of those parties were ever going to deliver for us. And then the last thing, maybe the smaller thing, but it still is germane. Foster was a, a tremendous advocate for what you guys are doing, to have an effective relative labor press he always bemoaned the fact that the newspapers and the magazines and the, the very limited publicity that the various unions had to tell their own story and represent uh, these concepts was miserable uh, or non-existent even. So anyway, he, he put a great, a great impetus to what became by the 1930s, a whole revival of labor journalism and labor research and all these things. So, so anyway, that's a, a little bit long winded, but I, I'll touch on that. That's for anyone who does not familiar with Foster. That's an awful lot of his, his uh, concepts and his theories. And that, and, and this is, those were some of the things that were in uh, strategies for organizing in the steel industry, for instance. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I should say anyone that gets hold of that or finds other works of his online or who takes the time and you should buy the book, buy the book uh, and pass it on when you're done with it. But you'll see that those themes that I just ran through there, uh, which is a mm -hmm. lot to recall, I realize they'll just repeat again and again and again through the decades uh, that because his writings are covered in there from the early teens uh, 19 teens all the way up through uh, the 1950s. And he was consistent with these. I mean, some historical changes and adaptations, but those basic concepts just repeat over and over and over again. And like I said, I, it, the book had such an impact on me because I haven't seen anything in 45 years to change my mind about any of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Looking, and looking I, today at the condition of the working class in the United States, which is pretty, mm -hmm. pretty sad, pretty mm -hmm. impoverished. Uh, I'd say that we're in need of a revival of the trade union movement like nobody's business. Right. Well, I think that, um, you know, so, some of these things that you mentioned here, um, it, it, it also highlights to me the fact that the fact that the people in the Amazon labor union were took so much or, or that, uh, you know, obviously it. Like you mentioned the other day, it's not like Chris Smalls necessarily is hanging on every word of William Z. Foster, but there is a, there is an active and 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 relevant part of the leadership that are. Uh, but you know, one of the strategies is, is boring from within as opposed to creating creating new. And the Amazon Labor Union is obviously creating new, and it, maybe it's I, I, I'm not 
terribly familiar with the internal politics, but I would presume, given their success, that they're not particularly, like, ideologically, you know, uh, uh, puritanical, we could say. You know, I think that some people in the left can can. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if that if can be an issue. Me, if you'd allow me, Jake, I, I know yeah. just you know, I, I know Justine a little. Uh, if anybody glances, you know, Facebook being the thing for the older set, you know, if you glance at Facebook, I have a photo of her and me together. I, she was just down here uh, earlier this week, and uh, you know, we visited on some of this stuff, a lot of other things. I mean, she's one of the core group of the Amazon labor union group that did win that election. Uh, you know, fantastic work that they did. I don't think it's so much that they set out to build a perfect union at all. I think it's just I have a concept that I'm I'm un uh, I, I the more I think it through the more I'm convinced of it is that what what it really is with the Amazon labor union and many of the younger workers today it's just that they're unconnected to the old guard the old order of things or they're disconnected from the old order of things and they don't have a great deal of connection to it they don't have a great admiration for it they don't have any um tremendous uh, confidence in it. And I think that what the Amazon labor union really represented was a group of young militant workers, some of them leftists like Justine, some of them foster rights that are there, of course, you know, taking advantage of the internet and the access of all these things. And they just did not seek a bigger union. They didn't see that as the great goal. And I think that that says something about their political thinking, which I think is to be commended in a way. Self-reliance is always, always a a good thing. But I think for the labor leader, well, you know, the AFL-CIO is just opening up its convention right now as we're meeting uh, there in Philadelphia. I mean, you know, this is, I hope, something that's on some of their agenda, even if it's their private agenda. You know, we, we ought to get this on the record, guys. The Amazon Labor Union an independent union started by these workers. It's not an AFL-CIO uh, affiliate. Uh, the Starbucks Workers United, Starbucks, which is another whole multi-thousand movement that's growing and is going to, frankly, eclipse the Amazon thing, at least in the short term. It is uh, in a union, uh, Workers United, SCIU. It's not affiliated to the AFL. And then my old union, the United Electrical Workers, had a an enormous victory uh, two months ago in Massachusetts with a, right. an election win of 4,000 workers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mm-hmm. It's not an AFL-CIO affiliate. So I don't think that that's a knock on the AFL at all. I think it hopefully is pause for some of the AFL affiliates and their convention, which is made up of their affiliates, to say, hmm, certainly there is organizing going on among some of the AFL mm-hmm. affiliates. But why is it that we've had the biggest wave? I mean, that that little mouthful that I threw out there, that's more than 15,000 people in motion in right. NLRB elections. And, and let's get this on the record, guys. You don't get, you know, I have to remind politicians of this, and sometimes our own, I have to remind people. In this United States, union organizing is an illegal um, act. Now, in Alabama, you guys probably wouldn't need to hear that more than once because you might know it. But anywhere else in the country, it is an illegal act to organize a union. That's why firings are common, terror consultants, anti-union counterattacks from employers, you know, built-in union avoidance systems are, are the norm in corporate America. But to have those three, you know, relatively speaking, gigantic elections all erupt and to find that they were all that what what's the common denominator of them? They're all led by young militants, and some of them leftists and some of them followers of William Z. Foster, all in all three. And I, that, how do I know that? I know the leadership of all three of those unions. Right. It's a kind of an odd thing how that developed. But it's also they are. Uh, not affiliated to the AFL, or at least not yet. Maybe they will become at some point in time. There's probably merit to that or whatnot. But anyway, and and they're young. They're they're not guys like me. Uh, I'm not in any of those three. You know, I'm 60 years old, so they don't have guys like me sitting around telling them what to do. They've taken the bull by the one. So it's it's a good thing, but I think it's also you know pause for reflection for the old unions to say, Mm. you know, uh, what's happening here, uh, you know, and I think it's a good thing, though. by all means, it's, it's a very invigorating thing. 
Right, right. I'm interested. I I, I want to get to what are some of the things that that he says. Cause a lot of this list to me seems to be um, as. As people who are who are organizing, what are some of the strategies for moving your union to action? Right, um, presuming you have power or that you can acquire power. I'm interested in, in in part of in in some of what he's like, how he says to acquire that power. What are some of the strategies that he has in American trade unionism for acquiring that power, for bringing people into the movement? That are uh, how how is it that the militant minority is it, how is it that they convince the people around them to follow them? Uh, but but before we get to that, really quick, and and, and I just want to have this as as kind of a side conversation because it, it it's something that that struck me and is interesting, but is not terribly relevant. But I want to ask it since it's it's our program. So, um, <laughs> but the the boring from within, and this is something that I've that that always seems to make sense to me. Um, if you're in a union. Um, and you've got an apparatus, and you've got resources, and you've got members um, boring from within, and, and getting a active institution or, or an existing institution to move towards being better, towards being more active, seems to me to, in general, obviously I think different contexts require different things, but as a general rule, I think that makes sense to me. Um, but then uh, the political independence, and, I, and I've always... I've always kind of took that attitude as well with electoral politics to the extent that I am at all interested in electoral politics. I came out of trying to kind of, quote unquote, reform the Democratic Party. I tried to do that for a few years as a college student, um, inspired by kind of Bernie Sanders stuff. Uh, I ran for the state executive committee of, of the Democratic Party in Alabama. I was in the college Democrats. You know, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. And, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I just I was totally disillusioned. I was not. And 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 this seems to be a, a better use of my time, frankly. But to the extent that anybody is interested in electoral organizing, um, it seems to me that boring from within makes a certain amount of sense because there is a large segment of the working class that seems that, that sees the Democratic Party as on their side. And so we could use a militant minority, you know, it, and, and so the, the juxtaposition there of having a view of political independence of labor from Republicans and Democrats advocating that and advocating a boring from within strategy within the labor movement, that seemed interesting to me. So I was wondering if you could speak to that briefly. Sure. Uh, uh, kind of two halves of that. Uh, the boring from within piece. Uh, let's get some things on the record here. The, the labor movement in the United States, when taken collectively, is the most financially wealthy labor movement in the history of the universe uh, of all time. There isn't a labor movement anywhere on earth that has more money piled up, more assets, more property, pays the kinds of salaries that it pays to its leadership, spends the kind of money that it spends on the union leadership, the bureaucracies and all these things. It's a fact. There's no reason for anyone to try to talk themselves out of that. But yet, if you looked at this tiny slice of that entire pie that was actually dedicated to organizing brand new members, unorganized workers, bringing them in, it's minuscule in comparison. It's minuscule. Now, you'll have certain unions that spend more and pay more attention to it. And you'll have others that don't do anything. And of course, why is that a problem? It's a problem because you cannot defend the gains you've made when you've got uh, eight or nine percent of the workforce organized and you're drowning in an ocean of unorganized workers all undermining you, you can try, you can swim against the current, you can, you know, you can still do better than the unorganized when you have an organization, but you can't make the kinds of gains that you need to make as a as a trade union movement and as a working class. And the, the fact that the leadership's in most unions, just absolutely refuse to dedicate the kinds of resources and priorities to campaigns, mass campaigns of new organizing is criminal. And this is something that Foster exploded over and over and over again by trying to force the leadership to, you know, to support the various mass campaigns that he had he, and, and had some success. He did in doing it. And uh, in any case, that same struggle goes on today. I, I, you know, look, I mentioned the AFL-CIO convention. We wish them well. They're in Philadelphia. We'll see if it even breaks the surface with the news media. But to me, 
I'm concerned or maybe I'm um, partial to looking to see what news are they going to have to say, hey, we're going to work with the affiliates to redirect substantial or even massive resources into organizing on a mass scale. I, I'm not optimistic that it's going to happen, but I, I can dream about that. So, But then secondarily, you come back to the question of uh, political independence. I, I always remind folks that the, there's a, quite a divorce between the trade union world and the political world. Well, what, what does that look like? Politicians at any level, your city council person, your county council, all the way up to the president of the United States, they get elections on a calendar basis. There's an election next week. There will be another one in two or four years. This is the political reality of this country. Now, the other political reality is, is that we have a two-party system that systematically excludes the growth and development of any third parties. Uh, I think folks are aware of that. that. This is what Bernie Sanders faced and every third party that's ever come along. You are by de jure fiat, you know, barred from the ballot and everything else. So let's not go to bed tonight thinking that the quote unquote two party system is something that you find in the Bible. And this is a man, man made creation here. So let's get that on the record. But anyway, talking about elections, Joe Biden will face election in two years and several months, like it or not. But let's get it on the record, folks. Trade union elections in terms of organizing elections, we only get them after we have conducted, a, a, you know, an underground campaign to build the network, the militant minority, which is what ultimately in most, if not all, organizing drives, not necessarily leftists, but the folks who say, hey, I'm fed up. We're going to form an organization and we're going to confront the boss. What are we suggesting here? We're suggesting a rebellion. That's what a trade union organizing means. We have a lot of unions try to talk you into, oh, we want to be a union so we can be a partner with the company and everything. Well, look, no worker believes that. Uh, <laughs> some union leaderships might believe that and maybe a few politicians. And It's nonsense. I mean, what you're doing is you're stimulating a rebellion of workers to gain power and push back against the boss. The boss is dictatorship. The workplace in the United States is a dictatorship. Now, again, speaking to you all in Alabama, I don't believe this is going to be any surprise at all. But the workplace in the United States is a damn dictatorship. Uh, and I think it explains an awful lot of why we're having a great difficulty, you know, trying to convince people that they should defend what's left of their political uh, democratic institutions and whatnot. But anyway, uh, you know, none of these politicians, not one, would accept the kinds of electoral conditions for their own race as what we have to live with as union organizers. Think about this. Uh, would Joe Biden or would Donald Trump or anybody else, would they accept it as a legitimate election when they're, when the voters can be press ganged into meetings and be paid to listen to the anti Joe Biden, the anti-Trump, you know, rants of their employment. No, nobody would accept that. That's that's not a not only yeah, getting paid to listen to those rants, but being threatened with a lack yeah. of pay if you yes. don't listen to them. That's right. Yeah. If you don't vote for Joe Biden, we're going to fire you. If you don't vote yeah. for Donald Trump, we're going to fire you or we will begin to fire people. Then you'll see mm -hmm. we're not just threatening. The Sorry. So I always say this and I say no Democrat, no Republicans going to lecture Chris Townsend about what democracy really is or what the meaning of life is, you know, no, this, this is a fundamental reality that, that the parties have to represent. Now, I'll say this, in my 45 years, I think the Republican Party has shed any of its previous uh, wrapping that might have, in, in, you know, might have convinced people that they were interested in something that was fair or the condition. No, the Republican Party has unmasked itself as an utterly reactionary uh, vehicle to impoverish people and, and you know, increase mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the imbalance that we already have. That They're clear. So I commend them, at least for their honesty. But the Democratic Party is more conflicted. It's a bigger mm -hmm. tent. And you've got folks wringing their hands who want to have it both ways. You know, they want to have the they want to have the rain without the thunder and you know, all of those mm -hmm. analogies. And I just look at it and I think, you know, we're headed we're well into a real uh, rough spot here for working people. You know, I'll mention this, which I'm sure this applies uh, in Alabama. I know it applies here to me in Alexandria, Virginia. You know, all you need to know is go back to Bernie Sanders, even if you don't like Bernie Sanders, which is a lot of people. Bernie was the one who publicized the fact, fact, fact 
that when he ran for president the first time in 2016, the science uh, indicated that half the working class at that time, 2016, couldn't come up with $500 if it had an emergency. Hmm. Okay, then uh, Brother Sanders decided to run again in 2020, as everyone knows. Now, again, even folks that don't like him, uh, he brought up uh, an, uh, an amended fact just four years later that at that point, half the working class couldn't come up with $400. So I look at folks and say, okay, I don't know what the Democratic Party is waiting for. Are we waiting for absolute impoverishment where we have half the working class that can't come up with a nickel? Uh, then we'll take the kind of swift and dramatic action that's needed to go after, you know, runaway corporate power and corporate dictatorship and all. I don't know. What, where, where is that bottom line for them? I don't know. I know I've already reached my bottom line. That's why I'm doing what I can do. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, stimulating organized trade union rebellions against all of this is my life's mission until my life runs out. And uh, nothing I've seen in those decades has proven that it's going to happen any other way. Right. Yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's generally the attitude that we take on the show. We uh, spend much more time talking to workers than we do politicians. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. so then let's talk. Good. Let's talk some. I'm sorry. Good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk some about. Uh, some of the, about those strategies that I was talking about. You know, he advocates for a militant minority and, and kind of recognizing that this is this is an important thing to have, an important thing to strive for. How is it that he proposes that the militant minority gain the trust um, in a you know, and, and presumably in a in a in a real and not. Um, and not a manufactured way, but actually the 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 rest of of the masses of workers in, in a facility in in a region uh, trust these people um, enough that they are respectful and interested in what the people who we could call the militant minority have to say, and what the people we could call the militant minority advocate for. Um, wh- sure. What are some of the things that that, that he recommends? Yeah, people I, I that see themselves down. in that, how do how do they talk to their coworkers? Yeah, I think it boils down, Jake, that it's it's a matter of authenticity. Uh, folks join the union all the time for all different reasons. Uh, in a state like yours, they join only because they want to join, uh, except with a few rare exceptions. But in the rest of the country, they may have to join. And I think that one of the really scary exercises that the labor movement is prone never to want to take up, but I suggested for folks is say, why, how, how many members do you have as compared to dues payers? Now, you can say in a state like Alabama that probably the bulk of the folks who are dues payers are also members. Think about the distinction between both somebody who's consciously saying, yeah, this is good for me or good enough for me and I will belong. But you go into the states that are not uh, right to work, where we are able to bargain union shop coverages and whatnot. You know, people are enrolled and there's not necessarily any work done or not enough work done in some cases. Yes. But these folks come in and they contribute. So there's a there's a a danger there in assuming that folks will do this. So anyway, the, the, the authenticity that I referred to is what folks need is that you, you, there's an old adage that I was taught when I was uh, a member and a staff member of the United Electrical Workers. You join the union to get something out of the boss, not to get something out of the union. Think about this. You join the union to get something out of the boss, not to get something out of the union. Now, sadly, when you go into many of these business unions, you see a leadership that essentially has carved out for itself, uh, you know, quite tidy livings, frequently in excess of what the members make, sometimes enormously ahead of where the members make. And you find benefits and perks and whatnot. And look, it's a perk just to work for the union because you don't have to go and be subjected to some foreman, some supervisor, some boss, you know, it, on the workplace, the fact that you're able to do the work and even be out of the workplace, that in and of itself is a perk. But this becomes a divide that can, if unchallenged, uh, develop into a political difference or what would you call it? A, a, a different interest of that leadership. 
in terms of, you know, do they want to rock the boat? Do they, you know, they're, they're comfortable. They're, they're there. They become established. Maybe they've been elected. Maybe they've been appointed, but they then begin to take on a, a different interest than what the members have. You know, think of it. You go into any workplace today that has a union. I think I'm safe to say that the vast majority of the members would say, I want the union to spend the bulk of its time doing the things that it can do to further our interests. Now, a lot of those members may start by saying my interest, but it's the duty of the union to say, well, we're here in this as a collective. So we're doing everything we can do as a union by its nature. It's a collective effort. And most workers that I've ever run into will support that. But when you have a slice of your union leadership that is so highly compensated and and begins to develop a different orientation, they begin to want to hang on to that position because it's better than they could do by going back to the workplace, you know, and and I'll say there's an old adage. It must apply down in your neck of the woods for any of the hunters who are listening here. But there used to be the old adage that said a fat dog won't hunt. Mm hmm. And when I think of the fat dog, I think of so many of the folks that are, you know, in the sadly in the labor leadership positions. They're they're well. I mean, the salaries at the higher echelons are indefensibly high, and these folks, you know, they don't, you know, uh, uh, someone like us in a grievance situation back in a workplace, a ninety-nine cent grievance, some aggravate. It, it's inconsequential to these folks. Well, anyway, to come back to Foster, Foster ruthlessly, ruthlessly uh, exposed this. And and actually, you know, in Foster's time, uh, we should say compared to today in Foster's time, there was much more over corruption going on in many of the unions. And Foster was a he, he wrote an entire book called Misleaders of Labor. And it was a real expose of, you know, certain little entrenched bureaucracies and little, little, uh, you know, dictators that had taken over the unions and were just squeezing them out for their own purposes. So he took that on. An awful lot of that has been cleaned up. I think today it's uh, much less of that, although the employers would make great hay about that, and, you know, would uh, claim that we're all corrupt, which is nonsense. But, but anyway, the authenticity is the, what defines the militant minority, the folks all of us know them. There's maybe most of the listeners here fall in this category. We're the folks that get out of bed in the morning and go to work and do all of our work. And then we, for the boss, and then we do our union work and we do our organizing work and we do all this. We're not getting paid or we're not getting paid very much. And it's thankless many times. And it's, uh, you wonder out loud, you know, how much longer is it going to get worse? I mean, look, I, when I joined up 43 years ago, I joined the first union uh, it's been getting worse every year since I started mm. there, you know, so you have to face that. But I also will hit everybody with the jackpot uh, reality, which is, look, we're not rich enough to give up. You know, uh, giving up is not an option for the working class today. I mean, you, I guess theoretically you can and many people do, but you're just going down the drain into poverty and misery. Uh, the younger generation today, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm 60 years old and I have the great luxury of being able to retire and I have two pensions. Uh, The the vast majority of the younger cohort out there working today have no pensions. So they're going to work until they drop. Now, when you're 25, 35, 45, that that seems like a far away (laughs) day in time. But when you get to be my age and you have a bad heart and you're just kind of like, wow, I I have a few years, I want to do some things. Uh, without it, I'd be working until I dropped. But that is going to be the forecast, unless we can revive uh, a more militant and aggressive labor movement. And again, we're not going to do it through highly paid people and experts and academics Mm. and all these nice, well-intended people who want to offer opinions. No, we're going to do it with regular workers who are authentic, who want to get something out of the boss and not some little privilege for themselves and we'll do it through some really sustained uh, combat with the employers and with the state forces, if need be the government forces, Mm -hmm. that's the fact they almost invariably defend the employers. Uh, Another lopsided unfairness that we're faced to deal with. But, uh, but anyway, again, Foster's entire themes just 
echoes support for that militant minority that authentically wants to build the labor movement for the good of the membership strictly and for the good mm-hmm. of the working class more broadly. One of the things that you said Foster advocated, the militant minority advocate, is a um, we could call, we could say a liberal use of the of the strike tactic, um, and not not a not a willy nilly not not you know not just a, a haphazard use of it, a, a thoughtful and uh, but but and in a use of the strike tactic. And and you told me a story yesterday that I thought really int- uh, that really illustrated the value of the strike tactic, not just as a um, you know as as a sort of um, idealistic lefties love strikes but as a real material this is how workers win and why it's important to strike so would you care to would you care to tell us that story sure yeah i mean i set the stage for it first though in foster's time his early part of his career pre-national labor relations act so we'd be talking the middle 1930s going back the 50 60 years for the labor movement that existed before then. There was an adage. I don't know if Foster was the one that coined it, but there was an adage that said at that time, pre, you know, when there was no governmental structure to organize, the the mantra was all organizing is to prepare for strike. Because folks may not know this, that prior to any legal governmental structure to allow you to unionize and have some way to get an election, some way to gain recognition, some legal offset so that the employer might actually have to settle a contract with. Before that, the only option you had in most cases was to strike. So this was why this is maybe what formed a lot of Foster's more militant Uh, views, which was every quote unquote organizing drive became a discussion with folks about, okay, we're going to build up our forces and then we're going to down tools and we're going to strike and we're going to force this employer to meet our demands. And, uh, you know, an awful lot of the labor relations regimen that we live with today at the NLRB, at the Railway Labor Act for rail and airline and then federal Some of the states, only a few of the states have it. Alabama has no such state uh, statute that provides any structure for people to organize on the public sector side. But anyway, uh, prior to that, organizing was all you had. Now, it it has been quite an advance for us as a labor movement to get where we're at. Now, so strike struggle here in our context is usually in, in the context of contract bargaining and trying to force, uh, you know, extract demands out of the employer. So uh, I would just say that Foster's constant revisitation of the strike tool and the strike weapon is just to remind us that it's a tool in the toolbox. Uh, It certainly was in his day in a much bigger way, but even today it is. And look, we have to look and say to ourselves, how do we uh, defend what we have? And how do we win the kinds of things that we deserve and we want? And I guess I'll say that the the, the strike tool, you have, uh, I think it's still going on, a pretty considerable uh, coal mine strike going on down there, the warrior strike with the United Mine Workers. Um, I mean, d- a desperate struggle, but a necessary struggle and uh, to defend what they have. And, you know, you look at this and you say, you know, in the United States in the last couple of decades, strike struggle as they count it. Uh, you know, the government keeps statistics on all this. It's come to a low ebb. Uh, it's not over. It's not stopped, but it's at a low ebb. And it's also reflective, I think. And you've got to connect this with what Foster was saying about our, our the unwillingness of the labor unions collectively to go out and try to organize I mean, the, the, you know, the reason why the United Mine Workers find themselves in, in part in the jam that they're in down there is that there's a gigantic section of the coal industry that is unorganized, that is not unionized. Uh, you have folks working for much, much less in different places. You have other issues there, too, uh, the environmental shifts in terms of usage of coal and all this. But, uh, you know, we're, you know, Foster, I'm kind of paraphrasing Foster, but he always talked about how we're never going to be able to 
achieve the kinds of things that we want to achieve and need to achieve at the bargaining table, as long as we have this whole army of unorganized people arrayed against us. Now, most labor leaderships and most people would think that the boss is the enemy, that the boss is the roadblock to that. Well, of course they are technically in your microcosm, but what is really the roadblock is the fact that we have in this country you know, 93% of the private sector working class is arrayed against us as unorganized tools of the bosses, uh, unable to exert any pressure on their employer with one exception. I quit. That's what you have in the United States. Thank goodness to the abolishment of slavery, you're not allowed to quit. So they can quit. And we have people quit by the droves. And now during the pandemic, they call it the great resignation. Well, I'm glad for that. We're not industrial serfs here. We can go. But that's uh, really how people express their ultimate disgust uh, rather than organizing. And I think that that, you know, is where I come from. The fact that we are seeing a mass, you know, uh, walk away, a mass quit is proof that if we would reach out to them, if these unions would seriously sit down and go out and and take campaigns of organization. If any of you know anyone who's quit recently, many people would say, I would stay here. I would continue to work here, but I'm not going to do it under these terms. But again, lacking any way to force their employer to make any kinds of concessions, they quit. And all of us have quit jobs because you have to, you know, and I should say this uh, news flash to everybody, you know, at, at the end of the day, what a trade union is in the United States is it's really just an organizational vehicle that you, if you have it, you have this theoretical chance at least to force your boss to start doing things or stop doing things. I've given that speech to many union organizing guys, people, you know, they overthink it. People, oh, a union, my God, it's all this, it's that, it's, oh, it's a big decision. It isn't a big decision. You're joining an or you're forming or joining an organization so that you can force your, you know, at least as you're collectively in your workplace to try to force your boss to start doing things or force your boss to stop doing things. And I, I, I don't know, I learned that along the way from somebody, I'm sure. But it sir has stuck and, and rung whole, you know, whole and rung uh, true with me. So anyway, my final thing, Jake, to your question about strike struggle, I think I was telling you about the uh, strike that we had here in Northern Virginia uh, against privatization. Uh, And it was one of the most legendary successes I've ever seen in uh, strike struggle. And I was intimately involved with it. This was a transit property. When I was at the Amalgamated Transit Union, we organized a bus company up here, a privatized bus company where the work that they were doing had been taken away from one of our large public sector established locals. And of course, the wage was cut in half and the benefits were eliminated. Of course, privatization is just a scam to, uh, you know, cut wages and eliminate benefits. So we organized these workers, which was difficult. And we struck, which was difficult. We struck for 84 days. But at the end of that strike, not only had we won the strike and won our demands, but we had won the legal reconversion of these workers back to the public payroll where they never should have been privatized from. And those workers today, this was three years ago, those workers today are now on the government payroll. They have real pensions, real health insurance, real holidays. They have the ability to move within a, you know, a 12,000 Uh, worker transit system in terms of other opportunities and trainings. They're not just stuck in some, you know, retrograde multinational company paying them nothing out here in Lorton, Virginia. I mean, this is a life-changing success. Now, that being said, that was life-changing for the workers. And I was very proud of the role that I played in that. I'm the one that took the strike vote amongst other things. Uh, I don't believe at all that the leadership, of the Amalgamated Transit Union has yet learned the lesson of that strike because what we needed to do was prove that we could do it. And then we needed to replicate that 
hundreds of places to get these workers back onto the public payrolls that they never should have been privatized from. Now, that, I think, is a question for the leadership of the union I just retired from. Are they going to see it that way? Are they going to see that this is not just a one time? Wow. Wasn't that amazing what we did there? No, this was not a fluke. This has to become the mission. And actually, the uh, now deceased uh, president of ATU, Larry Hanley, that entire struggle in Lorton, Virginia, with the Transdev Corporation, where we accomplished that, that was his mission. That was his job. He orchestrated that, said he put me on it. uh, And uh, he passed away kind of midstream during that. So he never was able to live to see the um, the fruits of his uh, labor. But when we were putting that Together, we realized that. And the reason why we had banked on strike struggle was is that we just knew that none of the employers involved were ever going to agree to this if we were not on strike. The most dramatic uh, throwing down of the glove. We knew it was going to take that, you know. So uh, so anyway, the strike tool today, uh, while it is not a foolproof thing and uh, having been a worker that is on strike, or have been on strike, you know, personally myself, you know, it's, you have to think that through. It's not anything to be taken as a rash act, but, uh, but anyway, we could use more of it. Strike struggle today is too few and the workplaces where it is succeeding and moving people forward, they're too small. So we're not yet getting now. Last thing I'll say on this guys is, Historically, you can do the, the, you can, you know, they keep statistics on some of this stuff. One of the greatest triggers of strike struggle historically going back 120, 150 years are employer, unilateral employer demands and wage cuts that they put on people. Well, I'm going to sit here and venture a little bit of a production we've had during the pandemic. We've had many. Uh, unorganized employers throw a little more money out there to attract people. There's some labor market problems and we can't find people and all this. It will be interesting to me to see a couple of years down the road when that labor market situation gets something more back to normal to see if the employers unilaterally take these raises back. I think it's probable that we will see that. And a scenario is developing. Uh, maybe I'll be the first to predict it on your show, that if we begin to see some significant demands for wage cuts, we will see unorganized workers really rise up and rebel. That, For whatever reason, over history, that is one of the more confident predictors of real labor unrest and strike struggle is when the employer just says, I'm going to cut your pay, take it or leave it. And uh, I hope that it doesn't happen, but I suspect based on what we see shaping up that that is likely anyway. Yes, and I, and that I think that is a really good illustrative story. But I but that actually wasn't. You told me a couple of one that wasn't the, the one that I was thinking of. The one that I was thinking of was the guy that you said was a wobbly, um, oh. who who when he was when he was a wobbly in the twenties that you met. He his yeah. union went on strike all the time over anything, and he said it was really you know he he didn't like striking all the time, but he was amazed at the power the workers had over yeah, the boss, yeah. no, and then I, he worked for them. yeah yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this was, I lived, uh, I, I, as I said earlier in the show, I, I left Pennsylvania as a teenager, went to Florida and fell into an ATU organizing drive. And in any event, I rented a little apartment, whatever I could afford for 140 bucks a month, I think it was. And I had a landlord. So my landlord reminded me one day that he wanted my permission to go into my apartment during the day when I was at work so he could show it like he's going to sell it. And I, I kind of was panicked because I just thought, oh, no, he's going to sell the place and I'll have to move. And I kind of liked it. He was a good landlord. And anyway, uh, I gave him permission. But, you know, I'm a I'm a union man. I'm a militant. I had my left wing material and a, some posters and books. And I thought, well, I'm not going to clean up my apartment on. You know, I'm thinking, what am I afraid of here? It's supposed to be a free country. So it's my apartment, for God's sakes. I pay my rent. So I left all my stuff out. Anyway, he he stops me in the driveway at some point after that. And he says, hey, I didn't know you were one of those guys. And uh, this was 1980, I guess. And I remember thinking, "Uh oh, is this good or is this bad? Is he think that, you know, because unions, whatever they are, everybody has a pretty charged opinion about them. And he says, I got to show you something. So he takes me into his apartment on the ground floor. He lived right there and he had his IWW red card 
tucked into his family Bible. And then he couldn't be, have been happier to tell me this story of how he was a member of the IWW in California, which is where he was from, but then he had retired from the painters union out there. But in his early career, he had been part of the crew that, that was represented by the IWW that was blasting the aqueducts down from wherever the water came from down to Los Angeles. It was essentially a hard rock mining operation to do this. And he just reverentially told these stories of how they controlled the job. That union was, it, it, but remember, this was deadly, dangerous, low-paid work uh, with a really unforgiving boss. And the union reflected it oppositely with the strength and militants that it had. And they used to exert. Now, remember, they were up in the boondocks and uh, mining, and there's no town around. There's no modern way to get around. So they had the boss somewhat outnumbered and they could strike and they could do these things. And the boss wasn't able to really resist as much. But anyway, he told these just his eyes shined when he would tell these stories about how they would strike over the smallest things. Uh, But they weren't small to him. And his notion was, if you let the boss have an inch, he's going to take a mile and we're not going to give him the inch. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because he, I think this is what I had finished by telling you, Jake, that he, he went on to be, join the painters union and he would, he, in that conversation, he contrasted the two that even though he thought that the IWW was a little too militant, it performed and it was legit and he had great reverence for it. Now the painters union was a little more kissy, kissy, a little more go along, get along, but he did get a pension out of it and whatnot. So there was good and bad on, on bad on both of that. But yeah, he, uh, that was the story of uh, how they went on strike one day because the lunch didn't include a pickle and that the union delegate always went to meet with the chuck wagon cook every morning to review the menu and think about it. There was nowhere to go. There was no way to buy anything up in this booty. So if you didn't, if your boss didn't give you a decent three squares doing this work, you were going to, you know, starve. So their thing was no pickle, no work. And, you know, you look at that and some people might make fun of that or think, oh, my, that's a little bit too much. No, screw that. If you're one of those workers out there working for a low wage to begin with, dangerous work. Mm. And then mm-hmm. the, the least you can expect is that the employer would make provisions to, you know, feed you half decent. A pickle doesn't seem like a big deal. So, yeah, the, the strike struggle is uh, can be a magical thing in the right hands. Yeah, Adam, have you? Uh, I, I've been kind of uh, uh, lording him uh, or, or, or hogging him. Uh, uh, have you got any, any, any qu- anything uh, that you wanted to ask him? Well, I, I think, you know, I was trying to take some notes here on, on the highlights you have from Foster's work. And the thing that stood out to me is how relevant these debates and these mm-hmm. concepts are yeah. uh, and how really we are engaging in a lot of these same debates now in 2022 that you know foster was writing about decades ago um and and i was just wondering if you just want to take a look at sort of the trends of what we're seeing now with amazon and starbucks as you mentioned uh as well as other campaigns do you think that some of these concepts of fosters the militant minority the political independence boring within do you see is it on the comeback? Uh, I, would that be fair to say that that there is sure. a section of the labor movement uh, that takes these principles seriously and is gaining traction? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adam, I, I, I would say absolutely. Is it a world sweeping type thing, tidal wave? No, not yet. But, uh, you know, I uh, did an interview a few weeks ago where I just reviewed the the constantly diminished number of union organizing drives until now. You might have seen the statistics in the news that the number of NLRB elections, which is one of many, many ways to measure the the condition of the, you know, the number of workers in motion to organize. So it's, uh, granted, it's only one way to do it, but it's a key one that covers the private sector. And uh, the number of tr- uh, petitions for uh, union elections in all 50 states, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and Guam, whatever the hell. So, no, the, not, whatever the Pacific Marianas Islands, it's covered by the NLRB. The uh, 
number of elections when I joined up those years ago, decades ago, was about three to 5,000 elections per year, covering ordinarily thousands to hundreds of thousands of people in the aggregate. The number that I dug up uh, was that uh, 2020, we had 950 some on elections in the United States. Now, there was a pandemic. Let's not in any way minimize that. But it was reflective of a long drop off. 2016, I had looked up the number. It was like 1,475. So it only declined from 1,475 to 950-ish because of the pandemic. So let's not, you know, let's be clear. Let's not monkey around with the statistics and try to use them to make our own case. But this is a catastrophe. And then the secondary catastrophe within that number is that the number of workplaces uh, that have more than 250 or 500 people in them that will actually have an election in the current thing is you can count on probably two hands and one foot. Uh, because the number, it's not just the number of elections, it's the size of the elections that have been dramatic. Now, what this is reflective of is the mass repression of the employers and the government. I mean, again, this is an illegal thing to try to do this. Oh, everybody will say, no, 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 we're just making our associates aware of their rights. That's baloney. These corporations and the government that makes excuses for them, that protect this dictatorship and this you know, autocracy and whatnot, but in any case, the, the you might have seen just within, I believe, like within the last week, there was a statistic where the number of union elections, let me get this right, the number of NLRB elections have hit 1,000 so far this year. Now, think where we were, 2021. Mm-hmm. The whole thing was 950. Now, we're already at 1,000, and it's only coming to the end of June. And this yeah, here, here's the statistic like- that you were thinking of. Uh, there, there's a Twitter account called Daily Union Elections, and, and basically every day yeah. they'll screen cap the NLRB filings for the day. Uh, in the tweet, he said, the 1,000th petition for a union certification with the NLRB was filed uh, on May 31st. In 2021, the 1,000th petition wasn't filed until October 4th. The yeah. last time we hit 1,000 petitions this early was 2010. Yeah, and, and I, it may not say this here, but I can tell you guys what the punchline is. This is Amazon. No, mm-hmm. no, hold on. Let me withdraw that. Starbucks. It's Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, I got right. the two mixed up. Yeah, this is Starbucks. This is the Starbucks movement, the phenom. There are hundreds. They've already won. I think the number was 140 elections, and there's several hundred more in the works. So wonderful for this, but this goes to show you what one small, relatively speaking, what one small movement can do to kind of, you know, charge start the rest of the labor movement. And I venture to say it will improve. I think there was a part of one of these releases I thought it talked about that it's likely that this year will exceed 2000 for the whole year. I mean, this is wonderful. And, you know, I, I should mention a quick thing in this same vein. Uh, and I might have touched on this earlier. Stop me because I've had several interviews where I've gone over the same territory. But anyway, we had Amazon election, which everyone's aware of the one in Staten Island was over uh, 6,000 people and it succeeded. And we have Amazon, which is a work in progress. It's a bunch of very small employers, but all scraped together. They're well into more than 3,000 people have already successfully organized and another five or 7,000 that are in the pipeline uh, to come. So we're, you know, already at this point, we're more than 10 Starbucks. There's that many people Um, that have won. Yeah, when when you take the aggregate of the people, there's something like, you know, 20 to 40 people in each store. So it takes a lot to get it, but they're already now in excess of the whole Amazon, Amazon being just one location, but then my old union, the United electrical workers uh, organized this group of 4,000 at MIT. And, you know, I look at this and I say, here we have uh, three of the most remarkable large campaigns. There will, there hasn't been in the last several years, even three elections that large at all. I I don't even know. We'd have to sit and find out where they were by the NLRB. Now you'll find some airline elections bigger. You'll find some public sector elections where there may not be any resistance, but we're looking at these three campaigns where they were real knockdown combat with the employers, Amazon spending hundreds of millions of dollars to destroy the union. And they won. And it was Starbucks spending 
equally gargantuan sums of money to try to kill a union and the people succeed. And MIT, I don't need to tell folks, the MIT is not a pro-union institution. So UE defeated them and organized those 4,000 workers in spite of that. So you look at this and you have to take some some cheer from this and say, you know, let's study this. And I, I think it's worth looking at because there's various reasons why I happen to know the three different groups, but they're all young. Uh, they're all relatively inexperienced. If you were, you know, they're not guys like me. Uh, and they're some leftists, and that's broadly defined. You know, there's all different kinds. But, you know, folks who are pissed off that they're paid and treated like this, and they don't want to quit. They're making a stand. They're planting the flag and saying, no, I'm going to make this bo- boss do something. I'm going to demand that they stop doing something here. And you just have to love it. I mean, it's we haven't seen this in decades. And I just have to hope I actually I sit here some evenings thinking what's number four the, of a large group like that, because yeah, it is exceedingly rare. I, I'm just hoping it's not a fluke, uh, but uh, but it is a good sign of, of things. So I don't, I don't know, Adam, if that kind of got close to what you were looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something you touched on earlier uh, in terms of the great resignation you're, I 100% agree with you that that labor uh, and certainly labor leadership should be looking at this as a huge opportunity. Uh, this is, you know, it's a big sign put out there, letting us know there's worker discontent. There's there is a energy mm-hmm. among unorganized workers right now that has been the main outlet is just to quit and to go somewhere else where you're going to get very similar treatment and crappy right. pay and benefits or, you know, try your hand at the gig work life uh, and, and all the pitfalls that come with right. that. Uh, so well, I think let, there's, let me, there's demand there. Yeah, yeah. Let me jump in on something. I'll say this. Look, I commend you guys for inviting me to come on. Now, you may not know this, but you might be the only show in Alabama this all year or the whole decade that actually has a real union organizer on to talk about this work, <laughs> what's going on. We're, one know, of our tags is Alabama's only union talk radio shows. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, but think about it. There aren't very many yeah. of us around. You know what I mean? Even if you were getting up and saying, yeah, we want to find somebody, you know, you, you got to you search around, say, who is it? We're an unknown breed that's out there. Mm-hmm. And then what I the reason why I touch on this is and. I, 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 I am just, uh, I have to bite my tongue when we get to this point in the conversation, you know, anytime there's any kind of news or what passes for news with labor, with organizing, with Amazon, with Starbucks, you know, the, some of the media, what's left of the media will respond and find spokespeople and all this. Well, you almost never find the workers uh, that are speaking up for themselves. That's that's self, you know, we would all recognize them because they're just workers. Why would they have an opinion? Even if right. in like in the case of the Amazon labor union, they just overthrew a regime spending tens of millions of dollars to destroy them. Well, we, they're not they're not experts, so we don't want to talk to them. So what do they do? They drift or are driven or go back to academics, experts, critics. And then I just turn it off because I say these people, mm-hmm. most of them, not all of them, but most of them have never organized anything. Right. And I'm thinking this is also what ails the labor movement. The labor movement runs around and I mean, you know, they will seek counsel and consultants and studies, you know, about that. we don't need to study anything anymore. We need to go out there and talk to workers and stimulate these rebellions, these mm. trade union uprisings. That's the work that we need to do. That's what I'm doing. That's why I'm involved in some of these things. I'm not, I'm not paid by any of these people. It's just, you, you have to figure out how you can help. Uh, and I'm there, but you know, I, I think that this is maybe, I don't want to dismiss all of these folks because some of them are pro-union. It's always nice when you hear somebody, an academic or a writer or somebody who maybe you do know that they've never organized. They've never organized anything or very much if they have. So you have to applaud it. I don't want to, you know, denounce that. But it's just we don't get the real picture of what's going on out there by not talking to the workers or at least not talking to some of the organizers who are out there. Mm On a, in a hands-on way, dealing with these workers and the and the real condition of the working class, which is deplorable. The, the U.S. working class is in a, 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 a miserable, embarrassing. You know, this is third world conditions 
in half the workplaces in the United States. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody wants to sugarcoat that. Well, I don't give a damn. That's it's it's, I know what the facts are. You, and you mentioned, you know, that that news very, very seldomly will actually look to the workers uh, for any kind of story. And uh, last week on our program, we talked about a Scottsboro Starbucks that just filed for a union election. Scottsboro, Alabama, you probably wouldn't know, but it's a very rural, very white, very conservative town. Um, and so it's very meaningful, I think, that the, Starbu- uh, that the Starbucks there is the second in Alabama to file for an election. Uh, it's very cool and also very cool. The local news segment on it, first, cool that local news even had a segment on it. That was neat. And then secondly, also cool, is they interviewed one of the baristas, two of the baristas, to talk about it. Um, You know, just normal working people about why they're organizing and about why and 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 they let they gave them the microphone to talk about right. why they're doing this and why the community should support them why they said union isn't a scary word i mean it was just it was cool yeah. as hell you know it was only like 3 or 4 minutes but i was like how I, I don't know that there's been a better representation of labor on whnt in uh, the last 5 years yeah. you know uh, exactly it was exactly. awesome. No, it was and great. you guys should know, and, and listeners should know, you know, one of the, to me, one of the really remarkable things about Amazon and Starbucks and the UE example that I gave at MIT is that they really are run by the workers. There's, mm-hmm. the, you know, UE doesn't have enough paid staff to do all the work. They have to have these folks do it to get the force multiplier. And Amazon, uh, those workers that you've seen in the media, there's a couple of dozen of them. That's what it is. No hide, no guys like me stumbling around cashing their paychecks, helping them, telling them what to do. No, they're doing it on their own. And Amazon is truly that because it's it's also very atomized. You know, for folks who want to join the Starbucks Workers United, they go to the website, they send it in, and a volunteer uh, worker, uh, you know, gets back to them. I, I, one of my projects there is to get unemployment compensation for more and more of the fired workers because then they can work full time. <laughs> on the hotline, you know, taking calls from these baristas calling in from all over mm-hmm. who want to you know, do it. I, 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 I'm i driven to do it because I like the idea of, uh, you know, unemployment paying for the organizing. But uh, because we have dozens of workers that have been unfairly illegally fired by the company. But uh, but anyway, yeah, it's remarkable. And and I, now I should say this. I, the, there's always going to be a role for guys like Williams and Foster, I suppose, I'm no foster, but I'm a skilled organizer, experienced organizer. Yeah, we have our place, but we're not going to get the mass organizing and the big numbers because there aren't enough of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we have to have that multiplier and we have to have, you know, you have to live with the imperfections that that brings and maybe even the setbacks. But again, I I guess I come back to the AFL-CIO and their convention. We'll see. If they come out of the thing with any, I mean, they're, they're going to listen to NGOs and they're going to have college professors and they'll have big, I'm happy for all of it, but I don't know what it does to really get us on the ground in Alabama and begin to organize the, you know, the several millions of unorganized toilers down there. You know, that used to be the operative old word toilers and people don't hear that very often. Well, that's what we've been being reduced to. We're just toilers you know, for a few bucks and get out of here and come back. We'll give you a few bucks tomorrow. I mean, it's just miserable. And I'm pissed off about it. I'm disgusted by it. I think, you know, we have to remind people sometimes that, you know, you you are a human being. You should live better than this. You know, you should be compensated better than this. Your rights as a human being ought to be respected more than they are. I think big sections of the black community are well aware of that. Now, it's interesting Mm -hmm. when you mention, Jake, the white working force down there, this is you know, again, and what nothing illustrates Foster's point that when the white working class has so systematically failed or refused to reach out and unify with people of color, its own situation is going to go mm-hmm. down the same drain. And it's gratifying when, you, you know, I always say to folks, look, I'm a white guy from Pennsylvania. If you went back to my hometown of Pennsylvania, it's nothing but an ignorant Trump land, but they're living in misery. And they're going down the drain. And I, for one, decided I'm not going to go down the drain. I'm going to unify with these folks, you know, because, you know, we always have uh, lots, plenty of media that wants to accentuate all the things that divide us, you know, color, race, age, sexual orientation or whatever we call it. All these things divide us. Yeah. Uh, immigration status. 
But we rarely talk about what unites us as working people. And it's that we all have to find a boss to hire us by the hour or salary to pay us. We sell our labor by the slice. And when we do it, like the 93% of the workforce do it, we do it totally on the boss's terms. And we just have to hope that they're going to give us a little extra or something decent or, you know, give us whatever, at least the conditions will bear. But the working class is finally figuring out that you better have some, you better have some power when you go into that kind of a bargain. And uh, that maybe that was the difference when I was that age, why I grabbed on to foster and I thought, hell yeah, I'm going to get a job and I'm going to join a union because without it, I got nothing, mm. you know, I, as you can see, I wasn't born with great looks. So I'm, <laughs> I never, <laughs> never made a living with any of that. So, uh, but anyway, it's a, it is a good time. It is a interesting time an adventure, adventurous time in a good way. I got to say, I, I'm feeling hopeful um, in spite of the crises that we face that are so, you know, huge and almost beyond comprehension. I, I'm hopeful uh, when I see rank and file working people who are taking on some of the most powerful corporations in, in the world, uh, right here in the heart of the empire. And it's, it's, yeah. it's very, very gratifying to see that. And I, I'm inspired by it. And I just hope that the inspiration really resonates across the working class, across all of our diversity, uh, because it's the labor movement that helps us advance democracy and justice and solidarity and, and gain the victories that we so deserve. Yeah. yeah. And I really well, uh, appreciate yeah, you, let me, let you've me given me inspiration as well today. Yeah. Let, let me toss in some, what, what can listeners do? Uh, you know, a lot of folks will be listening and say, well, it's kind of cool. I agree. Maybe I agree with some or all of that. Great. What can I, what can they do? I'll tell you what they can do. Talk to these young workers, support them, mm -hmm. make a donation to Starbucks workers United. If anyone goes on to my Facebook today, you'll see that I just had lunch with three different young women, one from Amazon, one from Starbucks and one from a place you'd never heard of in Massachusetts. And they just happened to be here, but I just spent time with them to encourage them. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. How can I help? How can mm -hmm. I help? What my and I had mentioned the unemployment compensation for the fired Starbucks. I wasn't. I'm not paid to do that. I wasn't designated right. to do that. I saw it as a need and I took it on. Now that maybe seems a little haphazard to do it, but in the aggregate, if more of us who have the skills and knowledge would begin to help encourage these folks, as I have and I will continue to, we will see more of it and uh, all the boats will rise. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are no shortages. If you if you follow Starbucks Workers United and the Amazon Labor Union on Twitter, um, there are no shortages of workers that have been unjustly fired that you can yeah. donate to GoFundMes for to help sustain them while yep. uh, they fight the legal battle to get their job back. There's no shortages of stores, especially now with Starbucks right in your community. Um, there there are fewer and fewer places across the country that you're not within an hour of a, a union Starbucks or a unionizing Starbucks. Uh, go swing by there and order a hot drip coffee under the name Union Strong. Show them that you're supporting them. Yeah, exactly. And unionize your workplace. Uh, make your make your union, if you're in a union, more militant. You know, the, the more unions you were talking about, uh, people think that the boss is, 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 the, is the enemy, and, and that's true, but Another enemy, in a certain manner of speaking, is the fact that we've got 93% of the working class unorganized. So the, the, the more we bring that number down, the more helpful it is. So if it, you know, wherever you are, unionizing your workplace, making your union more effective is also, in a roundabout way, how, helping these people at Starbucks, helping these it people is. at Amazon. It really is. I'll point out, uh, Jake, too, for listeners. Uh, you you correctly refer to these workers as what they are, which is unorganized. And uh, what I'm about to say, I think folks will realize, is that the media and even unions and even people who should know better customarily refer to these folks as non-union. What, what does that mean? That's ridiculous. There, there's no basis in any reality. They're unorganized. And the reason why the employers and the media and every and colleges that don't like labor have gone that way is that they don't want to accentuate the fact that people would understand that if you had an organization, you have something. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's just non-union as if it's a, a condition of birth or something. You know, and I, I look at this and I think that as Foster taught us and proved to us that once you have that organization or if you work towards that organization, you better use it. 
You know, mm-hmm. another old adage that was taught to me by the old timers way, way back, which was to say, Chris, you don't need to join the union to get something that the boss is going to give you anyway. You join the union to go beyond and above that and to go far beyond that. And, uh, you know, no, you know, nonsense that gets repeated about all oh, unions were too strong and this and that. <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous. Yeah. Certainly, even if it did historically ever happen, certainly isn't the case today. I mean, the, the well, I, I'm so not aware of, of any period of American history where unions controlled the means of production. So, you know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, it's nonsense. That's right. And, and we and, and, you know, I jump on that right away because nonsense is what pollutes the airwaves mm-hmm. about unions and, and myths yes. and nonsense and craziness. And, and I, I also applaud the younger generation more and more of them to sort of see through that. And I, I have this construct that uh, you guys might have heard me touch on already. I mean, you know, that the old order of things is discredited. Media, church, government, even the unions themselves as part of this old order and that the younger folks seek something new, something different. They may find it. They may have to start it. But that uh, the, the, you know, the folks who have not led very well or misled us or whatnot, they're, they're not going to find a big following unless unless they resort to hate and, uh, mm. you know, demagoguery and all the things that we see some folks doing. But if there's going to be any high road out of this crisis, it's going to be driven by the folks that want to you know organize unions and minister to the needs of the working people and stop their abuse and all this, you know, so. But, yeah, I, I couldn't be more inspired uh, by all of this. So I just say to folks, find a place that you can help and do it. Hmm. Yep. Do it. Absolutely. Uh, Chris Townsend, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You've been really generous with your time, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, thanks to everybody, and good luck. Thank right. you so much. Really enjoyed it. Okay, yeah, we'll see you. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm. 